thief. It's just a chalupa. Hey, history peeps. Hope you're doing well out there. Welcome to the last video of the class. Wow, you did it. You made it. It's the last one for the class. You'll probably watch other videos in your life. Maybe right after this, you'll watch a different video. I'm really, well, I'm not sorry, because it's just history and it's what happened, but I'm, I'm going to tell you, it's kind of a downer still, you know, so that's what it's going to be, and uh, yeah, but we'll learn something here. So this is a topic called reconstruction. Reconstruction, when I say that, what do I mean? I mean the process by which the South was brought back into the United States after the war, because obviously those 11 states are not their own country, like if you look at a map now. They are part of the United States. So we need a process for that. Reconstruction refers to both physically reconstructing the South. Uh, there were many campaigns waged in the South that destroyed the infrastructure and the money-making ability and the homes and the lives of people. So we need to rebuild that. It also refers to rebuilding the governments. We can't have just the same governments. We need to figure out how we're going to rebuild our country with these different governments. And hopefully maybe even changing the minds of some of the people. Uh, there's a few things I'm going to talk about before I start talking about what happened, and these are just some terms you kind of need to know. This first one is kind of a, if you remember nothing else from this video, remember this. There is, are there something called the Civil War Amendments. That's three amendments to our Constitution. So remember, an amendment is a change to our Constitution. There's three of them. They're called the Civil War Amendments, some of the most important ones in our history. We still deal with these things today. Um, so the 13th Amendment just says no more slavery. It's pretty straightforward in that respect. It's not very long. It was passed at the very end of the Civil War, and it was just like, we're not going to have slavery after this. Now, maybe you're going to have a different system where you kind of make people grow things in a similar way, but you aren't going to have slavery. You aren't going to call it slavery. Um, and then in the 14th Amendment, uh, we still actually do talk about a lot today, and it's incredibly important. It might be the most important amendment besides for the Bill of Rights itself, and it guarantees citizenship to people in America. If you are born in America, regardless of your race or religion or anything like that, you are a citizen, all right? There's only like a few weird little exceptions to that, but basically, if you're born here, you're American, and that's that. Long story short, this is going to be a response to some things that the Southern governments were doing. It also means that the Bill of Rights applies to the states, which, believe it or not, we talked about that Bill of Rights a lot this year, and for a long time in our history, if a state wanted to do some messed up stuff against this Bill of Rights, that's fine. It can. Um, as long as it's not in the state constitution that it can't do it, it could still do it. So now, everyone has to follow this Bill of Rights thing, which I think is a good thing. Fifteenth Amendment is that you cannot deny someone the right to vote based on their color or their previous servitude, and we'll talk about why that was necessary. And then there's three, or no, two terms I need to talk about real quick that we'll talk about. The first one is a scalawag. A scalawag is somebody in the South, a native Southerner, after the Civil War, who is loyal to the federal government and joins the Republican Party. Okay, it was kind of a mean name. Oh, you scalawag. I know compared to the mean names that you guys hear, that's probably nothing. But it was considered kind of a derogatory term at the time, a mean way to talk about someone who, in the eyes of a lot of Southerners, is white but is supporting the federal government. The other one is a carpetbagger, another mean name, and that is a person from the North who, after the Civil War, moves to the South. Um, it was basically, the carpet bag was like a type of backpack they had, and basically, these people are coming in search of opportunities. They are going to say, I might not be able to be a famous, po important politician in the North, but in the South, there's a lot of people who can't vote now, so maybe I'll be my chance, or maybe I'll start a business and I'll be the first one in town. Lots of things like that. So... We start talking about Reconstruction, and now I'm really getting into like the story, if you will. Um, the Reconstruction plans that before the war is even over, and it's kind of clear the North is going to win. Abraham Lincoln the whole time is talking like the North is going to win because, you know, he has to be a competent leader. Um, they're talking about plans for bringing states into the Union. And there are what we call radical ones and more moderate ones. Radical to them then... It was radical, right? This is a big deal, a big departure from how things used to be. To us, a lot of the things the radicals want, probably not that radical. Um, so there's something called the Wade Davis Bill, which was basically, it didn't ever become law, but it was designed to make it 
difficult for Southern states to get back into the Union. It was basically meant as like a punishment. Lincoln's plan before he was assassinated was called the 10% plan. Basically, if 10% of your voters take an oath, so just they got to go to like a government building and swear loyalty to America, and if you do that, thir you um, ratify the 13th Amendment so you don't have slavery, you do those two things and you're back in. One in 10 people, you can still have nine out of 10 people who are super pro Confederate and, you know, maybe fought in the war and you're good, you're in. Lincoln was all about bringing everybody back together. Um, and he didn't ever have to deal with a lot of these problems. So whether he would have stayed that way, who knows? But that was like his plan. So Lincoln is assassinated in April of 1865. That is right near the end of the Civil War, um, slash at the end of the Civil War. But that means that Andrew Johnson takes his place. Andrew Johnson was actually a Southerner. He remained loyal to the Union. He was chosen as the Vice President because it sent a message to Southerners, hopefully, you know, we aren't here to punish you. We're here to bring you back into the fold in some way. So he becomes President, and it's going to cause some issues. This era is called presidential reconstruction. I say era, it only lasts like two years. But you basically have Andrew Johnson, who's very middle of the road and maybe even sympathetic to the South, believes a lot in states' rights still, and Congress, which is full of what we call these radical Republicans. Um, and they are very much not middle of the road. They are into punishing the South. Uh, whether that's good or bad, I don't know, but it's what they're into. So he is very lenient for a couple of years. He's like, hey, as long as you ratify the 13th Amendment, just do your thing. You know, you set on a piece of paper that you're done with slavery, we're good. It's all good, welcome back. Uh, Southern states immediately start to enact things called black codes, which really limit what African Americans can do based on the color of their skin. So, you know, they're gonna have trouble voting. It's gonna limit the types of jobs they can do and the education that they can get it's almost like you're going to have this section of your population that is just still going to be doing the heavy farm labor they were doing before the war under a different name. So it's not good. <laughs> Immediately, these black codes are happening. Groups like the KKK are formed during this time, and they are terrorizing these African-American folks. So a lot of Northerners are upset, and they start. Congress starts to pass legislation. They pass a civil rights bill. They uh, pass a charter for something called the Freedmen's Bureau, which I won't get into here because it would just take too long to explain, but you can look that up. Freedmen's Bureau. Very important. You can look it up. Uh, but basically, he vetoes that stuff, and Congress wants it bad enough they override the veto. So he is into just let the states do their thing. What could go wrong? It's not like that attitude led us to any trouble in the past, uh, but let the states do their thing, and Congress is not into that. He eventually gets impeached, but not removed, but that takes away his power. And when he finishes out Lincoln's term, we get Ulysses S. Grant, who is like, hey, radical Republicans, I was a general in the Civil War. I'm pretty down with all this Reconstruction stuff. Let's do what we need to do. And that begins an era called radical, radical Reconstruction. I like to call it Congressional Reconstruction, simply because... To us, it's not going to necessarily seem that radical because we understand as histor young historians how bad the Civil War was. We see a lot of the kind of racial tension and oppression that went on before and is even going to happen in the future. So to us, radical reconstruction, um, maybe not too radical. So federal troops move into the South and set up military districts. So that's definitely radical. The South is under martial law. You don't get to have your own local government you literally have a military governor telling you what to do, okay? So making laws for you and things like that. Um, the Freedmen's Bureau does get set up, and this is when we get the other, we already had the 13th Amendment, we're going to get the next two Civil War amendments here. Basically because the South was not respecting the rights of African Americans. These amendments are responses to a lot of the things going on. So the Black Codes... Um, start getting passed in all these southern states, you get the 14th Amendment, which is like, hey, these people are citizens now. You can't argue with it. If you're born in America, you're a citizen, and the Bill of Rights applies to states, and the Bill of Rights applies to citizens, so you have to start, you can't have black codes. That's unconstitutional. Uh, states have to draft new constitutions in order to get back into the Union and swear loyalty. Even after the 14th Amendment, many southern states do not allow African Americans to vote. 
So we get the 15th Amendment, which is like, hey, you can't stop people from voting based on what color they are. Um, and there's going to be plenty of other ways, which we won't get into in this video, but you can look up where even without saying anything about race, they still manage to keep people from voting. Um, so yeah, there are some good things in this era. There are our first African-American politicians in our country's history we see, which is, you know, kind of mind-blowing just because you, you look at a place like South Carolina where the population was 45 to 50 percent African-American had never had um, someone of a race other than white be a politician. Former con uh, Confederates have trouble. They are not really allowed to participate for a while. They got to swear oaths and work their way back. Eventually a law is passed that lets them participate in government again near the end of Reconstruction. Um, but there is basically an alliance of people that keeps the Southern Republicans in power for a couple of years. The newly freed African Americans, they are not into, you know, the old government structure, obviously. And then the Scalawags, who were the Southerners, who generally were not in the planter class, and now are like, hey, this is my opportunity to have some say in government. I'll be a Republican. And the carpetbaggers were Northerners who came down. That alliance of groups kind of keeps... Uh, Southern Republicans a thing at this time. And this is all going to go on through the 1870s until about 1876 is where it starts to really unravel. A lot of states have already gotten new constitutions and the military has left those places. Um, it's actually only three states still have the military in, uh, in their states, running them as like a military dictatorship almost. Um, but basically the election of 1876, there's not enough electoral votes for either candidate, which can happen, right? And there's a lot of disputed elections. There's a lot of allegations of ballot stuffing. There's a lot of allegations of armed men stopping certain people from voting. I, you know, that will never happen in the South again, I'm sure. But anyway, long story short, it's kind of a, a disputed election. So it goes to the House of Representatives, which is actually controlled by Democrats, including Southern Democrats, um, at this moment in time, Democrats are more about states' rights, Republicans not as much. So even the Northern Democrats are kind of on that side. And they strike a deal that they will allow the Republican candidate to be president. And I know it's your favorite president, right up there with George Washington, Rutherford B. Hayes. You guys are like, man, he's so great. He's not. So, you know, was it worth it? Probably not. But anyway, here's the deal. It's called the Compromise of 1877. And it basically says, we, the Democrat-controlled House Representatives, will allow Rutherford B. Hayes to become president if he agrees to end Reconstruction when he becomes president, which is exactly what he does. So Republicans out of this deal gain a president, and, and there's a few other things that the Democrats gain, but they basically gain an end of Reconstruction. So that's how it ends, and pretty much... After 1877, you have close to like a decade where that old planter aristocracy re-entrenches themselves. Um, they set up new economic systems called sharecropping, which isn't as bad as slavery, but still basically will um, get the same agricultural work done in kind of a different way. And sharecropping is a whole other interesting era in American history. Um, old Confederates start getting elected and can now fully participate, and the old politicians start to entrench themselves. Those African-American politicians we talked about disappear for the most part, um, and there's a lot of intimidation of African-Americans. You get laws uh, like segregation start to get passed in all these different states, and if you're wondering why, we had a whole Civil War, and then we had a whole Reconstruction, but we still needed a Civil Rights Movement 100 years later. It's basically because of this. And there's a lot of different kind of thoughts as to whether Reconstruction ended too early. I mean, Reconstruction was very unpopular even in the North because it cost money. Um, and even if you kind of hate that Southerner down there, you're like, hey, it's been 12 years and we still have troops down there and not letting them you know, run their state the way they want. Like, that's not okay. So um, there are a lot of different issues there as to whether you could even continue Reconstruction. But... Many of the gains are undone, although you still, you know, keep a lot of the positives and the people who were kind of on the bottom of society see their chance to participate fully and they're not going to forget that. So 
Reconstruction is still a pretty important thing, important era in American history. It definitely has a lot of shortcomings for a lot of different reasons. Um, but I'll let you look that up on your own because I have spoken for too long. I hope you have a great day, and I hope you enjoyed this class and maybe even learned something.